Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's edition of the Original Strength Podcast. This week's show is going to be about pushing the limits of human performance, and we have a very special guest, Mr. Martin Grubala, also known as the Honey Badger. And just so you know, just to give you a background on Martin, he is a professor of physics, chemistry, biophysics, and quantitative biology, but he is also an amazing man that has no limits. In fact, he's the honey badger. <laughs> so, Martin, thanks so much for being on the show. All right. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, I guess I might as well start with the name since you just mentioned uh, the yes, honey badger. Please. So I'm uh, you know, a member of a, a racing cycling club, the Wild Cards, in, in Champaign-Urbana, central Illinois. So that's where I'm located. That's kind of home base. Uh, it's great for cycle training. Uh, for, for training for ultra cycling, you know, super long distance races, because you've got this 15 mile an hour wind blowing, and then you just ride like 60 miles into the wind, and then 60 miles back home with the wind, and, and, and then call it a day or sometimes more. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, the, the honey badger thing is uh, what happened is I went to uh, Vietnam for a science lecture, and they took me to a Cobra restaurant. Uh, so they actually serve cobra there, right? and they have them live uh, you know, in, a, in a cage or a basket. And you pick one out, and it actually got out of his hand and, and lashed out of me and got like you know within inches of my face. And I, I did catch it on my cell phone. Of course, we always have to be ready right, with the phone camera. <laughs> and I sent this to my bike club. Uh, and then a few year, uh, a, a, a few. Weeks later, I was doing, uh, well, what for a while became known as uh, Ironman North Carolina. It was beach to battleship. It's one of those you know, Ironman distance triathlons. And 10 miles into the bike ride, I crashed on a cone that had fallen over from cars, you know, jamming into the cone from the other side of the street. And I wasn't, I was looking at my watch. Never look at your exercise watch. <laughs> well, anyway, so I ran over a cone and I landed on my chest. And I, as I found out later, I broke two ribs. Um, but I just got back up and I took four ibuprofen that I had in my little bento bag on the bike and just finished the bike ride and then ran the marathon on the ribs and actually did a pretty good time. I, I uh, Considering I was running with broken ribs, it was 11.01 overall. Usually I, back then I was more like you know, 10 something. Um, but uh, And then I checked myself into the emergency room and they checked, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so after that, uh, one of my friends from that bike club wrote a little poem that he sent by email. It says, you know, uh, Martin eats Cobra. Martin falls down, breaks ribs. Martin gets back up. Martin gets... <laughs> and so that was it. After that, uh, everybody started calling me the honey badger. Um, so I even made up a t-shirt that I wore during the race across America. Uh, and, all, and all my bicycle gear during the race across America had uh, uh, a honey badger on the back. <laughs> so, so you almost got bit by a cobra. That, I had no idea there were restaurants that serve cobra. <laughs> yes, yes. And actually, they did, it was not the fang or the venom because they don't usually come into close contact with the customers. So they are handled by people who know what they're, you know, what they're doing. So, um, but yeah, that was an exciting moment. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that would be exciting for me as well. <laughs> so, so you mentioned the race across America. What, what is that? So the race across America is a really long ultra cycling race. Uh, it builds itself actually as the toughest bicycle race on the planet. Uh, you know, we can argue about that, but it's definitely one of the toughest, right? it's, it's hard. Um, what it basically is, is you ride from Oceanside, north of San Diego, uh, over to Annapolis, uh, just east of Baltimore. And it's in a single stage. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, sleep is optional. You do whatever or not, you know, as, as far as sleep is concerned. And needless to say, the people who tend to win, I won my age group in the 50 to 60 uh, you know, category at, at, at the race. And then, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, I slept about three to four hours a day. So I was on the bike typically about, uh, you know, uh, between 19 and 36 hours nonstop, depending on the day. Oh uh, the uh, the open male category, don't you know, the guys that are like in the 25 to uh, to 50 range, and and there mostly the people who win are in their late 20s or mid 30s, as you might expect, right? That's kind of where you really peak. Um, 
they can get by on as little as 45 minutes of sleep a day. In fact, the year that I uh, won the, uh, the master's category at that race, um, I actually rode the same average speed and I spent the same amount of time on the bike as the race winner, but they only had to sleep for 45 minutes a day and I put in three to four hours. But, and I couldn't have, I mean, honestly, I, I, if I had tried to sleep 45 minutes a day, I wouldn't have made it through the race. I, I needed a little more than that. Um, so it's, it's it actually, it's tough. It has a very high average speed. So, you know, those 3000 miles in let's say 10 days or something like that, you're talking about going, you know, uh, typically between 12 and 16 miles an hour, just to put that in perspective, at the Tour de France, which is actually shorter, it's maybe like 2,500 miles instead of 3,000. It has about the same climbing. You know, they have the the, the Alps and all that, but you know, we have the uh, Appalachians and we have the, the Rockies, of course, that you that you go through. Um, uh, but still, you know, at the Tour de France, you're riding a few hours a day and you sleep and eat and do all your stuff, right? At this race, you're just riding the whole time. So the average speed at race across America is about, uh, you know, as I said, 12 to 16 miles an hour. At the Tour de France, it's four and a half miles an hour because you have 23 days to do those stages you know, that they do and the rest of the time you rest, right? You're riding like six hours or eight hours a day, not even that usually. Uh, and, and then you're you're free the rest of the day. So, uh, so and, and this is really what fascinates me about this race. It's, it's that it's not like short peak efforts, like you do something for a couple of hours and then you know, you're done with it. Uh, it's really trying to sustain an effort at a fairly high, at a high average pace, actually the highest average pace of any bicycling race over that kind of length of time in the world. And, and, and you just sustain that day after day, essentially without sleep. So you rode a bicycle for 21 hours a day for almost t for 10 days. Uh, it took me 11 to finish. Oh my the winner God. did nine and a half, the, the, the male open winner. And so the, the master's winner, uh, I did it in 11. Yeah, it's just, you know, you get on the bike and uh, there were, th I had three cars. So it's like the Tour de France, where there's like vehicles that accompany you and they feed you out of, you never stop, right? I'm just on that bike, literally, essentially almost uh, the 21 hours a day. Twice a day, uh, what we did is we had a crew change because the crew can't stay up 21 hours a day and do that day after day. So I had three cars and each would accompany me for about six to seven hours, feed me out of the window. And then basically what we would do is we'd do a quick stop. I would change my bibs. Uh, actually, one of the biggest reasons people quit in this race is because of infections in certain places. <laughs> uh, you know, you get saddle sores and, and, and things like that. But there are simple recipes to make sure that doesn't happen. You know, I'm a scientist, so I, I studied this all pretty carefully. And basically <laughs> just uh, uh, using uh, iodine solution to, to kill the bugs every six hours and switching to a new pair of cycling shorts uh, so that you don't have all the sweat from six hours, whatever. And so basically it was, you ride for six or seven hours, you're off the bike for five or 10 minutes, you change the bibs, you know, whatever, you get back on, the next crew is there, and then you go off with the next crew. You do that one more time, uh, then you do that one last time, so you've done it three times a day, and then uh, you stay at a motel three hours, you know, nap, get a little bit of sleep, jump right back in, just get back in the bike and, and do this again. Oh my gosh! I and I was going to ask you if you use science to help you. <laughs> yes, help you, train actually, actually, you don't have a choice to do that. Uh, this race has a really tough cutoff. So the, the fastest people in the world, so like the male open racers that are about thirty years old, you know, they can do it in about eight days. Um, but the race cutoff, actually, even in the uh, fifty to sixty category, is twelve uh, days. Um, so that's basically one and a half times that time. So this would basically be like saying that when you're running a marathon, right, the fastest uh, 25 to 35 year old people in the world can do it in about two hours and five minutes. And so your cutoff is going to be one and a half times uh, that, right? And that's about, uh, uh, you know, two hours, and it's about three hours and 10 minutes, something like that, right? So, you know, if the Boston Marathon had a cutoff of three hours and 10 minutes or any marathon had a cutoff of three hours and 10 minutes, there wouldn't be a whole lot of people finishing marathons because marathons usually get five or six hours. Or take Ironman, right? Fast Ironman races the world's best doing about 7.45 or something like that. Uh, sometimes even a little bit faster. But you're given 17 hours to finish an Ironman race. So you can call yourself a finisher and do less than half the pace. Uh, basically, the Ironman cutoff would have to be 
10 hours and 45 minutes or something like that to be comparable to the cutoff at the race across America. Wow. And so not surprisingly, like the year that I did it, half of the people couldn't even finish. Um, and uh, it's often at least one third to half of the people. And a lot of these ultra races do that, like the Badwater Ultra Marathon, right, which is kind of like a running race in that in that vein. You know, uh, even with all the selection and everything, uh, you know, it often has, you know, sometimes it gets up to 85% or even 90%. But in some years, like two years ago, it was 70% uh, finishing rate. So, you know, so people try and can't. So you've done Badwater also. Yeah, I did that next. Uh, so I figured, hey, you know, I won the master's category at the at, at Ram, you know, the, the world's quote toughest bike race. And I'm certainly not going to win the male open, right? I'm too old for that. I'm too old, too slow at this point. Um, and so I figured, okay, what to do next? And I figured, but hey, what calls itself the world's toughest running race, right? And again, we can argue there's lots of tough running races out there, you know, the Spartathlon. Uh, uh, you know, uh, ma marathons in the Sahara and all kinds of you know, good stuff. Uh, but this is a tough one. And uh, bad water, particularly for someone like me, is tough. And the reason is um, I do sweat. And, uh, and I sweat a lot. And I sweat actually more at high temperatures than I really need to, right? It, you need to sweat. Otherwise, you, know, uh, you can't really exercise at high performance because it's that evaporative cooling from the water on your skin surface that really contributes a lot to your cooling. Right? So your heart rate goes up. Uh, there is basically more heat flow from your core to the surface, you know, through your, your capillaries. Uh, and then uh, that heat gets dumped by evaporatively going uh, with the, uh, away with the uh, evaporation of the sweat. So, so when the sweat evaporates, it basically, you need to put energy into those water molecules to rip them apart to make a gas, right? Because the liquid goes into a gas from your skin surface and that carries away the heat. Uh, from your skin. Okay, so this works great uh, if if you are at a temperature below 97 degrees Fahrenheit, <laughs> which is your body temperature, right? And that's the temperature that the water is at when it sits on your skin. But you know, at at, at bad water. So actually, maybe I should say a little bit about it. Uh, bad water is a running race that starts out in Death Valley at bad water, which is the lowest point in the U.S. It frequently has daytime temperatures in the 120 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit region in July. And the race, of course, is in July. I mean, for the same reason they, they, that they put a Ram, the bicycle race, in June, right? So they want it at the hottest time in the desert of the year because it's supposed to be a real test of endurance. And so then this race is 135 miles. It used to be actually 148 all the way to the summit of Mount Whitney, but it's difficult to get uh, park service permits all the way to the top. So they changed it just to go to the uh, mount, to the gate uh, at 8,000 feet, uh, basically on Mount Whitney. So the first part of this race is you run 100 miles through a 125 degree desert. And at night, ooh, then it's only 117. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then and then you climb uh, a total of 14,000 feet, including the final 8,000 feet to get up you know, to, uh, uh, to the Mount Whitney uh, portal. Um, and so basically the idea in this race is that you're just dehydrating yourself and killing yourself at 120 plus degree temperatures for, you know, whatever, uh, anywhere between uh, 20 uh, something and and uh, up to 48 hours they actually give you in this race. I finished in third place in my age group uh, last year uh, in in 37 hours and change, and that's considered a pretty good you know. Oh my gosh, of average finish. Um, but the idea is basically you exhaust yourself and you sweat yourself to death at 125 degrees, and then you start mountain climbing for another 30 miles. You know, after that, just to you know, <laughs> you know for fun at the end. And so for, anyway, for me, this was hard. And I tried this race in 2018. It's actually amazing that Chris Costin, who organizes this, let me in because I had only a, a year and a half of ultra running experience. Like most of the people that do this race, I mean, there are people who have done 50, 100 mile runs or whatever. You know, like you look at the resumes and it's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and, you know, I, I did run, right? And then I started ultra running. So I, I, I did my like my first 50 mile, my first ultra run in uh, October of 2016 after I finished Ram a few months later. I needed to, Ram takes a while to recover. Oh, <laughs> so I, I didn't do imagine. much. I didn't do much between July and October. Um, I think I may have thrown in, I think I threw in a couple of, I, I no, I did the USAT, the USA Triathlon 
a national championship in between in August, but that was it kind of for for races. That's short. It's like you know, it's like an Olympic, so it's like a two-hour you know, uh, race. Um, but then, so I did my first 50 miler, and it went pretty well. Um, and I so I did another one three weeks later, and that went pretty well. I got faster, and so then I signed up for my first hundred miler uh, in November, just like a month later, because I figured, hey, you know, I can do two 50 milers, you know, in a month in a row. Maybe I can go. I don't know. And that also went well. I, I did a sub 20 immediately at my first. Uh, uh, 100 miles. Usually people are pretty happy if they do sub 24 hour runs because the 100 miles are mostly uh, trail races, right? So they're on some kind of a trail, it's somewhat irregular, you're running in the night when you can't really see. You need to pay attention, otherwise you face plant. Right. <laughs> uh, and so you, you, you've got to be careful there. Um, so I got into this and then I thought, oh, no, things are going so well. Why not just look up what like what is a really tough you know, long distance running race? And so that's how I found uh, Badwater. And, uh, and so I signed up for it and I failed miserably in, in 2018. So I, I did it twice, right? I, I tried in 2018 and I succeeded uh, in 2019 last year. Um, I was really naive in, 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 in 2018. I thought, you know, you run a couple of hundred miles here or there and do pretty well in them and, and you can run sub 20. And eventually I got down to 18 hours and, and, and below. Um, that, yeah, you know, this would be a problem. Well, <laughs> uh, I changed my mind actually the, the moment I opened the car door in Death Valley when I first got out of our air conditioned <laughs> vehicle, <laughs> because even training at 100 degrees almost or 100 degree plus heat index in Illinois you know, can easily get 95 degrees and 105 index. Um, it's, it's just nothing by comparison. I mean, the, the Death Valley is a thing totally all its own <laughs> that, uh, that one has to understand and come to learn. Uh, and so what happened to me is I did some heat acclimatization training in 2017, 2018, but my idea was to run out at 95 degrees in Illinois and to sit in the sauna maybe once a week or so and, and do some sauna because people told me they were doing sauna. Um, and little did I know that that was utterly inadequate for actually surviving. <laughs> at the, at the, so what happened the first year I did it is I would run and every uh, two miles, so about every 20 minutes, because at, at that temperature, at 125 degrees, I can't run faster than 10 minute miles. Right? I, I'd be uh, um, running, and then my crew would stop me and check did I drink my water or whatever. And I had drank my entire container of water, like 25, 30 ounces, and, but my weight had gone down by a pound in two miles. So then you know, I would run another two miles and I would drink my <laughs> container of water, and my weight now was down a kilogram, so you know, over two pounds. And this kept going until basically at about, uh, you know, after whatever, 10, 15 hours, I'm, you know, I just keep running through the night. The race, by the way, starts at 8 p.m. So you've already had a sleepless, so you've had a full day and, and then you have a, your first, it starts with a sleepless night and then goes to other sleepless nights, you know, from there. Uh, so to make it a little harder. Um, but basically by the time I got to, you know, close to 50 miles, I had lost uh, like 11 pounds or something like that of body weight. Oh my goodness. And, and I was basically doing one mile an hour. I, I could just slowly slump. That's, that's all I could do at that level of, you know, five or 6% dehydration. And, and I drank, it, it, it just, that wasn't the problem. I was sweating 80 ounces an hour and drinking 30. So I was losing 50 or whatever. You know, so that, that was just it. And eventually a race official came by and said, uh, sir, do you know that the cutoff for 50 miles at the 2000 you know, foot elevation sign is is at 10 a.m. and it is now 10:20 and you're still you know two and a half miles away? So I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to collect your chip. Uh, they had chips that year. They gave that up again the following year. So then I talked to some people who really know uh, uh, what they're doing. A nice lady, Pam, uh, who is actually the uh, 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 world champion in the female 60 age group. She explained to me what real sauna training actually is. <laughs> and so then I did that the following year. And so my training in the following year consisted of maybe running uh, 50 to 100 miles a week at 95 degrees outdoors, but that's nothing. So again, I did that the year before. That doesn't prepare you for bad work. But then in the evenings, I went to the uh, local Y and I convinced them to actually change their sauna over into a dry sauna, so not put water in there, and raise the temperature to 190 to 200 Fahrenheit. And so then I would sit in that sauna at 190 Fahrenheit. Initially, I couldn't take more than 10 minutes of it. It's like a fight and flight reflex. You just, 
you want to get out of there. Um, so I, but then I managed to build it up to 50 minutes. So I would do five days a week, uh, eventually up to 50 minutes uh, at 180 to 200 degrees. And it made an incredible difference. So what I would do is I would weigh myself before and after to, to measure my sweat loss. And during that time, my sweat loss declined at that temperature from about 80 ounces per hour to 30 ounces per hour. And 30 ounces per hour, you know, it's like a big bike bottle. You know, some, you could actually drink that in an hour. Right? And look, I went to bad water in 2019, same crew, you know, same race. The temperature was a little lower, like two or three degrees, but still it was in the 125 you know, range. And no problem. I drank my drink and I weighed the same after two miles. I drank my drink and I weighed the same. And I weighed the same minus uh, three or four pounds because of the fat loss. So you're losing about four pounds of fat while you run that uh, race. And I was exactly on target. My weight loss was exactly what you expect from the fat calories that had to be burned uh, to finish that race. So and uh, that was it. Through, so let me get this straight. So through exposing your body to a sauna that was about 200 degrees Fahrenheit, you taught your body how to sweat less through the acclimation of doing yes. that? That's right, the acclimation of doing that. And also, you uh, again, if you look at the medical literature, the capillary... Uh, formation improves. So you do actually get also better heat transfer from your blood, from the core to the surface in addition. The effect doesn't last very long, by the way. So heat training, it takes about three weeks to get to the maximum, according to medical studies. And that also fitted my, you know, I sort of measured my heart rate and my weight every day. Um, and then it takes about three weeks to disappear again. So you really have to do this before. It's not like you can do this and then for life you're heat trained. So like right now, if I try to do bad water today, I'd be one pound down in an hour, another pound. It would be basically, I'm sure, the same uh, story again. And the heart rate also goes down. So that takes less time. It takes about a week, and there have been medical studies on that. When I went to Badwater the first time, I got out of the car, and I'm standing there, and it's 118 degrees at night you know, when the race starts. And my heart rate is 125 beats per minute standing there. Right? I'm not... My resting heart rate normally when I'm lying in the morning and just checking, it's 38 beats per minute. So this is okay. bad. <laughs> this is like a 90 beat per minute higher resting heart. That's higher than most people's, you know. Uh, anyway, so it was higher. That was also part of the reason because then you start running, right? Your heart rate goes to 160 or something. And then you're, you're toast after a while. You can't sustain it. When I came back in 2019, my resting heart rate was 60 beats per minute. Still, you know. Uh, one almost twice as high as my real normal resting heart rate, but there was a lot more headroom there between you know right. <laughs> the heart rate I needed to run at and the heart rate that I had when I was just basically standing there in the heat. So how do you? you you've done a three thousand mile bike ride and you've done a hundred thirty five mile run and and through Death Valley. Other than the heat training, how do you prepare your body to do those things? So, so training is very important, and and I mean, so I, so I'm going to preach some of the things that I've heard from you, right? <laughs> because you do preach them, and, and they are actually true. I mean, the, one of the most important things is rest. So, you know, if you just train, 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 eventually you're just going to burn out. And so I actually did have a lot of rest periods during my uh, training cycles. And the way it worked out for me is, as a scientist, I do just a lot of traveling where I give lectures. Not for the last three months, right, with COVID-19, but that's <laughs> normal. Right? And so there's actually lots of times when I'm flying around or I'm at hotels and whatever. And rather than desperately trying to get on the, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the workout room and run on the treadmill at the hotel or stuff like that, I basically just said, you know, I've got three days at this place. I'm flying in. I'm giving a talk. I'm just going to have their big dinners that they serve you at the, you know, and I'm just going to give my talk and that's it. And I'm just going to take off for three days. So I had plenty of these kinds of, uh, uh, you know, little periods in between, you know, where I, where I just got total rest. Uh, in between those periods, though, I do work, uh, I, I do work out a lot. So I exercise a lot. Um, so a typical session, I do basically cycling, swimming, running, and then weightlifting with uh, you know warm downs that involve you know OS kind of things you know to, to sort of you know get the body kind of still with some exercise uh, you know, breathing exercises rolling exercises things like this you know, all the way down to you know to equilibrium again and so you know a typical week might be something like uh, um, 
I might do a 200 mile bike ride on Saturday uh, and then run 30 miles on Sunday because I have time, you know, more time on the weekend. And a lot of ultra runners, by the way, do like back to back 30 mile runs. Uh, and I find that not very helpful because that kind of destroys me doing that <laughs> twice in a row. So I do uh, like, uh, as I said, like a 100 to 200 mile bike ride, which is much gentler on the legs than running. Uh, and then I do the 30 mile run. Uh, the following day, but you're tired aerobically and in every way from the, from the cycling. Um, so that would be like the weekend. Uh, and then on Monday, after this really extensive exercise, I'll do aerobic weightlifting. So a lot of it is self-supported weight, like pulling myself up on the door jam, you know, to do uh, pull-ups and chin-ups, things like this, uh, um, uh, you know, push-ups, uh, a lot of squatting. If I use weights, I use very light weights. I mean, we're literally talking like, you know, five to 10 pounds per hand or something. That's it. You know, I don't go more than that. But I'll do a lot of reps. So, you know, in an hour, I think my record is I've gotten in 1,500 reps in an hour, something like that. Oh, my so, goodness. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, doing a lot of, uh, that's doing a lot of reps. And then at the end of this uh, exercise, I will basically go through, you know, my, actually, you know, Sarah, you know her well. Right? She's my, uh, she's basically my, coach that talks common sense into me. So I, I talk to her about you know, when things get out of hand. And she's, of course, an OS you know, person also. And so she's given me a lot of tips on breathing exercises. I like the frog roll a lot uh, at the end of my workouts. Um, and the reason is, it's actually still a real workout, but it kind of gets you down, you know, back down to baseline from doing like a, a 500 reps of, of, of something. And, uh, and it exercises the whole body, right? Because you're, you're really getting up and you're sort of juggling your leg and arm on one side and then rolling over and then you're doing it again on the other side and you sort of rock back and forth between those two positions. And I feel like everything, my back, my neck, my legs, my upper and lower leg, my arms, everything actually gets a, a workout, but not at the intensity level that you know, if you're doing you know, weightlifting. And so I do that for a while. And then basically breathing exercises at the end. I might be on my all fours and you know just taking some deep breaths. And eventually I just get down on my back and just lie down flat on the back and, and do a uh, you know uh, breathing on, on my back. And then I'm done and I've cooled down. So that's the Monday. And then on Tuesday uh, I might do like a marathon. Um, on a Wednesday I might do a, uh, um, a 50 mile bike ride with. The group, you know, the wild cards that I mentioned. Uh, on Thursday, I might do another marathon, or if I feel a little tired, maybe just a half marathon. Um, and then on Friday, same thing again, right? To get ready for doing the, uh, the, the what's coming on Saturday and Sunday, I'll tend to do um, a second session of uh, aerobic weightlifting, and that gets me an hour of exercise, but without really, you know, I I, it, I still recover while I'm doing that. And then, as I said pretty much every two weeks or so I have like three days off and I'm traveling or doing something else. And I do take those days just off. No regrets. How, uh, how many miles do you think you cover in a week? Um, so uh, the uh, uh, record I've done in a month, uh, in, so I'll give it to you in terms of cycling mileage. And for okay. running mileage, you should divide that by three because like cycling 60 miles, that's about three hours. And running 20 miles, you know, if you're not running too fast, that's also about three hours. Um, and so uh, I've peaked at 3,000 miles a month, um, so that would be like 800 miles a week. But I would say a more typical week is maybe 200 to 300 miles. All right. Um, I so, gotta... so in other words, 70 to 100 miles of running or 200 to 300 miles of cycling. That's amazing. Um, I got to ask you, what do, well, first two questions. How much do you weigh? Uh, I, when I'm not race weight, uh, I'm at about 145 pounds and at race weight, I'm at about 142. Not a very big, not, not a very big difference. How, how many calories do you eat a day? I eat a lot. So my wife is uh, from Greece and so she cooks the Mediterranean cuisine. Uh, so it's all olive oil and, uh, uh tomato based sauces and things like this. Uh, not actually, not too much of, I am a meatarian, I confess, you know, so, um, but actually a lot of it is based on okra and, and uh, uh, aubergines or eggplant, I guess they call them in the US, and uh, you know, all kinds of vegetables and foods of that sort. And so that's really the base of that, uh, of that uh, uh, cuisine. And uh, I, you know, it depends on the training day, uh, but I typically try to put in 
anywhere between three to 5,000 calories uh, to maintain my weight. And if I don't, of course, actually it's kind of funny. So when I'm not working out, right, I'm going on these trips to conferences, they're taking me to these nice restaurants. And of course, these are restaurants that have like 2000 calorie dinners, right? But you know, I ate a granola breakfast that day and the lunch was also some small thing with the grad students or whatever at the university. And so I'm eating the $2,000 dinner. But for me, that's actually like a major drop <laughs> in the calories. Uh, well, they're all complaining like, my God, you know, look at this, it says, because the menus nowadays have calories on. Right. Like, oh, the entree is 1200 calories and the, the, the cake for dessert is 800 calories, right? And I'm going like, yep, that's about half <laughs> of what yeah. I usually eat, no problem. <laughs> and you're like, I want two main dishes and two desserts, I'll, please. Exactly, I'll do, exactly. And you're, Can I have your leftovers? <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. So, all right, so you've done all these amazing things how how do you train your mindset to do these things how do you set your mind yes so that's to be completely honest with you actually that's more important than the physical training i would say the mind rest and the rest the sort of mind the frame of mind and the rest are actually really the most important uh, things even though it sounds like he's just training 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 it's those two days a week when i just do light weight lifting and the days when i don't do anything that, that make it work in the end otherwise i'd be overtrained um so uh, for, for the mind, I accustom myself to it by doing the running and bicycling under conditions that are mentally tough every time I do it. So to give you a good example, for instance, uh, I did a session uh, a couple of months ago where I just did 14 half marathons in 14 days, just one half marathon a day. Uh, and that's a, that I, can, I couldn't do a marathon a day for 14 days. That would really kill me. But 14 half marathons a day, that's kind of... Uh, okay, um, but that wasn't the big part. The, the bad part was I did this ma uh, these marathons or half marathons on the same truck ridden shoulder of a state freeway, uh, basically just running you know six and a half miles down and whatever six and a half miles back up, the exact same one every day under the same conditions. So it's just it's that same. At the end, I could actually I'm running along and I could go. There's the, uh, the the tissue that somebody discarded three days ago. And that means it's only another minute or so before I get to the plastic dragon wing from a toy that somebody threw out the car window, right? So <laughs> you get to know the terrain <laughs> at, at that kind of level. And, and you're just one with it. It's like a Zen thing. You know, I run along and I look at the white stripes they paint on the freeway and I actually know the pattern. So I know at what part of the run there will be like three paint strokes versus seven paint strokes from the you know, little painting machine that they use. And I call it the lizard brain, but I'm a scientist. So actually my job consists of like thinking, thinking all day and solving analytical problems and, and doing this kind of stuff, you know, 12 hours a day. So actually I find it very zen to just run and for an hour and a half count how many strips there are in the paint on the side of the road. Um, other things that I've done, uh, but that's cheating. And so that's not the mental training is I've taken like, a, you know, as part of the science, I need to edit journals. And when you edit journals, you have to read the articles that people write. So actually, instead of reading them, I would record them and then just uh, have them a PDF player, you know, play the vocal, the sound, you know, play, the, read the recording for me, basically. And I would just do that while cycling and just listen to the article. So I got work done <laughs> while, while uh, writing. But that's not fair because then your mind is distracted and that makes it a lot easier. And many races actually don't allow uh, headphones or things like this, like the Spartathlon is an example where you have to get through your 150 miles and because it's on roads, uh, they, they make you do it without uh, headphones. Um, so basically, I would say I actually seek out monotony and I actually have learned to enjoy it. So I used to hate it. It's like, man, God, you have to drag me out there to run. I used to love running like with groups of people and I like cycling with groups of people. But I've gotten used to the idea. I look at running as meditation now. So you you run, you focus on something simple like the dimples, you know, those little dimples they do so the cars make a noise when you when they go over the dimples, and you just count those into the thousands or ten thousands, or or you look at the stripes on the side of the road, and it puts you in this very weird frame of mind where you almost have an out of body experience while you're running. So I almost feel sometimes when I'm deep into the run that I'm actually watching myself on this road from above. Well, I'm kind of like just, you know, like an ant kind of running around on this uh, you know, strip. 
And it puts you in this weird meditative frame of mind where time just passes. I mean, I've done runs, obviously, honestly, where I'm running and suddenly I'm home. I'm going like, okay, I'm, I've done 31 miles. I'm done with my 50K for the day. And I didn't even realize that, that a whole lot of time has passed. And when you can get yourself into that frame of mind, these races aren't that bad, right? Because you're, you're running and you're at the finish line. Right. I mean, actually, Badwater felt like that. I was there were really only three stops for me in Badwater. I was running to a little town called Panamint, and there my crew did a little rest stop for me. And then I ran to the exit of uh, uh, the the, the uh, uh, Death Valley you know, National Park, and there my crew did some longer thing for me, like 45 minutes. And so, so that that sort of registered. And then I did the rest. And actually, when I think of the race, it almost seems like I'm at the start. And suddenly I'm in Panamint um, and my crew is doing stuff. And then I get going again and, and suddenly I'm at the Death Valley exit sign. And then my crew does some more stuff and boy, suddenly I'm at the finish line up on the mountain. So that's kind of how the memory <laughs> almost so, feels after the race. You may really be above your body watching your body run. Um, it sounds like you are having uh, yeah maybe I have an out of body experience. Out of body experience huh? I don't know, but that's kind of how it, that's definitely how it, how it feels. Uh, and anyway, but getting yourself into that kind of a frame of mind that's purely meditative, and, and where you're not trying to worry about your daily worries or or even doing science or anything like that. Uh, as I said, I call it the lizard brain, you know, because I'm really just you know, thinking of the grass on the ground or the uh, the, the stripes on the road or whatever. That's what actually makes it then pretty easy for me to get through long distances mentally. And there's also no time. The other thing is, even if you're feeling miserable, when you're focusing on the stripe on the road and that's all that's in your mind, you don't even realize you're miserable because you do feel miserable in these races. Right? By the time you're at mile 90 of a 100 mile run or you're at mile 2000 of a 3000 mile bicycle race, you are miserable. I mean, everything is hurting, right? Your your butt is hurting on the bike. Your legs are hurting on the run. Your neck is hurting, um, but you kind of can just blend that out. That's amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. Uh, it does sound very. Uh, I don't know. That sounds very mystical, almost the way you it describe is. it. Actually, I and I'm a strong proponent. I actually believe, and this may not be true, right? I mean, because I haven't had both experiences. I've never really done meditation or things like that in any kind of explicit way. Um, but I think actually that that kind of running and, and actually gets you probably into the same state. So, so I don't know if I'm in the same state of mind as a Buddhist monk, you know, while they're deep in a meditation. But I could actually imagine that it's at least a closely related state of mind. So I, I read some of those accounts, and based off of what you said, I would say that I think you are pretty much close to the same state. <laughs> yeah, probably it's, it's that kind of a state of mind. So if that's true, then I would say, hey, okay, so here's my tip for, for mental preparation, right? Uh, get yourself into that state of mind where monotony is actually your friend, and it actually allows you to relax your mind while you're doing whatever it is you're doing. And then it'll be much easier to get through that, even if it's really long and even if it's painful. That is awesome. Martin, this has been really, this is very enlightening. I mean, that's funny. Uh, so, yeah, okay. <laughs> but just, just know, like, the things you're, you've been able to do, how you've able, been able to push your body, how you've been able to acclimate your body, how, like, really, like, I think you're the example of there really are no limits to what a person can do. Yeah, if you know, look, if if you're willing to push yourself and if you're willing to suffer a little bit of pain, and it's true in a lot of sports, right? I mean, there's you know, mountain climbing is another good one, right? I think there there must be a Zen element in it, and I've never done it, but actually I'm getting increasingly interested in it. So uh, I bet knows, that's coming. But I, I, that might be coming. Uh, another one that I know is coming for me is you know after the uh, I, I started out in triathlons and doing Ironman races, I did the uh, uh, actually. My last one, and that kind of was my goodbye kiss, was the, the uh, uh, Ironman Hawaii in October last year. Uh, but at some point, you know, that was Ironman number 22, I got to a point where I know how to do them now, right? And there isn't really that, there is no fear of failure or anything really at that point anymore. Whereas at Badwater or, or races like that, there is fear of, well, I wouldn't even say fear, maybe that's not the right word. There is actually looking forward to the possibility of failure, let's put it that way, because that's what makes it interesting, right? Is if right. you're not really sure whether you can even do this or not. Those are the kinds of races I now like to sign up for, is you know, I'm not totally sure whether this is going to work or, uh, or not. Probably a year and a half at least preparation. Weight gain, 
uh, for a swimmer, actually, it's not that good of an idea to be all the way down you know, to, the, you know, to that uh, uh, low weight. Uh, so we'll see what happens. You know, I'll, 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 I think I'll give it a try. Uh, I, I know Lynn Cox. Uh, she is uh, like one of the world's top open water swimmers. I would maybe even say she's the open water swimming legend. And, uh, and she actually nicely enough answers my questions when I <laughs> ask her questions uh, because she's definitely the world's expert. And so uh, I think uh, eventually I'm going to have to break down and do the British Channel Swim or something you know, like that. Uh, I think that'll be interesting. I think your adventures are just getting started, it sounds like. Yeah. Well, as, as long as I can keep doing it, I'm, I'm getting close to 60. So, you know, but, but uh, oh, yeah. hey. Who You're says you know, that's right? Who cares? Exactly. So. Well, Martin, thank you so much for, for taking your time and uh, doing the show with me. I really appreciate it. This, this has been fascinating. All right. Well, thanks a lot for having me on the show. And Guys, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's edition of the Original Strength Podcast with Martin the Honey Badger Grubala. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to this edition of the Original Strength Podcast.